philosophy is that we are all part of a big team that cares about the ocean. Um, and, and our frame for our work is that we're going to make better and bigger impact if we work together. Not one to one, but all as one big team, Team Ocean. Um, and the way that we try to help Team Ocean is to do something that not a lot of organizations have the – organizations or individuals or institutions have the capacity to do, which is to try to listen with really, really big ears to the entire conversation online about our oceans. And that's everything from new scientific papers to uh, discussion threads on Reddit to images that are shared on Facebook, Facebook to the comments on a New York Times article um, if they have comments turned on. <laughs> and we try to suck all of the social mentions which we kind of consider to be mini articles about the ocean um, and do high level, issue level analysis of them. Um, and what that allows us to do is to see what really drives big spikes in attention. Um, what are the moments when, for instance, a lot of people start to talk about sharks or about marine protected areas or about ocean acidification? And as you might know, Shark Week is coming up next week. That is a huge spike for sharks. Um, and what, for this project, what we wanted to see is how many people on a daily basis talk about California's marine protected areas. And we really focused it in on California because we were working with the um, Resources Legacy Fund that has funded so many groups that have helped to establish these uh, marine protected areas along our coast. Uh, we are based in San Francisco, by the way. <laughs> um, and if you look at this graph, this is all the different topics that we monitor, from the big conversation about the ocean to specific species like dolphins, whales, and, sh and sharks. Um, and if you see at the very, very bottom our issue for today, <laughs> marine protected areas, which is somewhat squished down there at the bottom, it's a very, very small conversation, which means on the one hand it's not reaching a huge audience, but on the other hand there's a lot of opportunity to significantly spike it. Um, and we try to take all of the insights that we can gather from these different kinds of monitoring activities and drive real campaign insight out of them. And that's what we're doing today is we're trying to figure out what we can do with the information we've learned about the conversation about California's marine protected areas. Um, in general, we do this across all the issues we monitor, and we produce the TIDE report, which then goes out to our network, the Team Ocean, and then they can share and send it to their networks and their audiences. And the idea is that we can amplify really important and shareable content. So let's turn to California's marine protected areas. Um, we did some research. It was a lot of research. Uh, we focused really narrowly on the California marine protected area conversation. And we are happy to report that there are some significant results. And a lot of those results are applicable not just to organizations working in California, but perhaps to people who work um, on marine protected areas worldwide or on protected spaces in general. But just to be 100% clear today, we, we just wanted to add a layer to the understanding about California's marine protected areas. And there's been a ton of communications research, our research just focused on online mentions, um, on Facebook and on Twitter and on uh, forums. The way that we do this is we look at a really big conversation and we try to drill down in order to build a massive keyword set that will pull in all of those different mentions. So for this issue, we took California MPAs and we broke it down into what are the different brands and organizations working on it? What are the different campaigns and hashtags? Um, what are all the news articles that got shared over the past uh, year? Uh, or I should say, our, our um, time frame for this research was December 2012 until January 2014. So that's a 14-month period. Um, and we're really, really looking at how the conversation changed over the course of 2013 to inform our efforts in 2014. So we pull all these keywords together. We put them in a big machine, basically. And it 
gives us all of the social mentions about, the, uh, about that big conversation. And then we take all of that and we are able to see line graphs of where it spikes. And we can drill down on specific points and understand what the conversation looked like. Um, and from there, we, um, we were able to do that, do a similar thing like this for marine protected areas for the specific California marine protected area conversation. And that's what this is. This is the graph for December 2012 through the end of January 2014 um, for California's marine protected areas. And what you'll notice is, as I mentioned before, this is a fairly low volume conversation. Each of these points is a daily point. And if, um, if we look at a median daily mention level, it's about 40 mentions. Um, uh, Middle, middle range of the days. Um, the average daily baseline, and how we define baseline is basically the, the level at which the conversation never drops below is 21 mentions. So that's really the, the lowest level that we don't get below. And that's 20 mentions across all of our different platforms that we're able to pull mentions from. And there are a few spikes that you can see. And we were able to drill down and figure out what drove those spikes. Um, and I will, I will categorize these across three different big categories. Um, this conversation spikes because of news articles and news coverage uh, about California's marine protected areas, um, meetings and conference activities, and that's online meetings and offline meetings. And then a big event, celebratory events, like the California Marine Protected Area's birthday, for instance. So for news coverage, and you'll see at the bottom of each of these slides, you can actually see the different days upon, uh, which have news coverage sites circled. Um, there was an article, for instance, in the San Jose Mercury News on the left um, that the State Appeals Court upheld the Marine Reserves Network. It was under attack, and that was a big moment. Um, the Los Angeles Times is actually one of the biggest drivers of spikes. There are several articles that came out in the LA Times over the course of 2013 that ended up driving spikes in this conversation. And it's usually uh, a lot of people who share the article via the share buttons on the article. So you'll see somewhat uh, blurry on this screen perhaps, but it's a tweet from Ocean Conservancy sharing that article. Another way we can spike the conversation is conservation meetings. And I should note that these are spikes that are a lot of mentions on a single day from a group of people who are participating in that meeting. So if it's a conference, there's usually a conference hashtag. Um, there were a couple of moments in 2013 when a lot of people working on marine protected areas gathered and were using the hashtag Calif MPAs hashtag. Um, so those spikes are lots and lots of volume, but maybe from a smaller group of, of people. Um, the example on the right is the MPAs Work Twitter Party, which was hosted by California groups or people who are working on California MPAs but is, uh, was uh, an online discussion that actually had a global participation. So the birthdays and the um, uh, uh, California Underwater Parks Day. So those are two known events. I, I know that many, many, many of the people on this, on this call probably had something uh, to do with those spikes that I just went over. So, Awesome job. <laughs> we saw you in our research. Um, and in fact, as you can see here, a lot of the conversation volume is coming from the NGO sector, and not just from NGO accounts like uh, the Our Ocean account for Ocean Conservancy, but from individuals that work at those NGOs, from um, spokespeople and scientists. Um, but a lot of that volume is, is really within the community. And from, uh, from that, we can actually see that a lot of the, the tweets, and, and we're only able to do this, this uh, 
word-by-word -word analysis on tweets. So this, uh, this graph only represents the Twitter conversation for our 14-month period. Um, a lot of the words are pretty technical. Um, it's, and by technical I mean educational or science-based. Um, not a lot of celebratory or um, not a lot of words that reference specific species. Um, and as with a word cloud, the larger words appeared more often. Um, you do see a word like in the upper left like celebrate. Um, but many of the tweets, like the ones that are shown on the right, were, were fairly technical. And to drill into that a little bit, a lot of that was about educating audiences about what marine protected areas do for California residents, um, what's involved in monitoring them, what was involved in getting them established, um, and really sustaining a committed group to, to uh, keep them going. Um, we looked at all of the tweets from this 14 month period and coded them by hand into three separate categories. And um, most of them fell into these three categories. There was a very, very, very small amount of, um, of tweets that, that didn't, but most fell into these three categories. Educate was the biggest one. Over half of them were really just information about MPA. Um, protect is a category that was um, uh, included not just calls to protect California MPAs, but also um, Stories of success, so um, they are working. And then love is really just purely celebratory. We think California marine protected areas are awesome. They have really cool animals in them. We want to go visit them. Um, just pure love. No call to action, no um, you know, heavy data about how they are working. Just pure love. And this is how it broke down. So it was mostly educational, mostly technical. Um, but what we did see is that there was the highest engagement from Love and Protect Tweet. While they represented smaller slices of that pie, um, you can't quite necessarily see the numbers on these, but this is a selection of tweets that fell into those two categories. And you've got 20 retweets on one, you've got 19, you've got 25 on another one. And this is compared with around three to five, um, maybe even fewer on other types of, of tweets. And if you were to look even smaller at the small, small dates on these, um, I just wanted to highlight that many of these uh, love and protect tweets came later in 2013 and early in 2014, which shows us that the trend is moving toward sharing really um, celebratory messages. And, and so we think that's very promising because those have higher engagement. <clears throat> we also did uh, drill down into the conversation about a few uh, specific protected areas in California. We chose these based on um, their keyword ability. <laughs> um, we couldn't unfortunately look at something like uh, La Jolla because there's a lot of conversation using the term La Jolla that is not about the marine space. But um, we looked at these to sort of get a sense about how when people go to these places or when they talk about them online, how do they talk about them even if they're not using marine protected area language. And we were able to do the same sort of analysis and see what kind of what drove the spikes in these place-based conversations. And across the board, it was photographs. Um, people engage with these places through visuals, and it's because they're really beautiful places. Um, and Instagram is a huge driver right now of, of social mentions about, about California's marine protected areas. You see a lot of Instagram photos. Um, so we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit later about what to do with this information. But I wanted to take a pause here and talk um, to you a little bit about what we found and see if there's any questions about the data. Um, Judy asked, what were some of the analytic tools we used? Um, our primary tool was Radian 6. Um, it is a tool that pulls in the fire hose of data from Facebook and Twitter and uh, mainstream news and blogs and um, comments and 
uh, forums and all sorts of things. But for a lot of the language analysis and um, influencer analysis that we did, we used Topsy Pro, which um, allows an export of all of the tweets about a specific topic over a specific amount of time. And that one is just Twitter only. Uh, we used a few other tools, but those were our primary tools. Um, what about short video views and usage? Um, we, we found that videos were also shared, um, mostly photographs, um, but there are a few, very few short videos that, that cropped up. Um, not a huge driver right now of conversation. Um, and I see, can you tell me how much of the spike phenomenon is organic and how much we are driving? And I would say it's both. <laughs> Some of the spikes are organic in the sense that uh, a news article gets posted and people just share it because it shows up on their um, uh, when they visit the website of the newspaper. Um, but often um, it's through the the work of um, organizations who pay attention to that that it gets big. Um, so it might get you know 50 mentions, but if a bunch of organizations share it and ask other people to share it, it might then get a couple hundred. So it, it can really, really be driven by the conservation community. Um, and in some of the cases, it was just conversation among the conservation community. So those are definitely uh, driven by the group of people that are on this call. Um, and we chose this period because uh, it was the closest period uh, that we could choose when we started the research. Uh, we wanted to get it as, as recent as possible. So that is our, our excuse. <laughs> um, we wanted to know what was the most recent information that we could use to drive conversation and drive our campaign strategies right now. Um, I see what are one or two of the ocean stories that account for the large ocean story spikes and that dwarf MPAs. So I'm going to just uh, uh, interpret that maybe a little bit, but um, you know, in some of the other conversations that we monitor, we've seen um, big spikes in uh, ocean acidification also driven by news media. That is a very news media driven conversation um, when the Washington Post or the LA Times or the Seattle Times publishes a big article on ocean acidification. It drives the spike. Um, it also, um, when people make very um, important statements about it at international meetings, for instance, Jane Lubchenco saying that it's the evil twin of climate change, that uh, drives the spike because it's very quotable. Um, in sharks, it's Shark Week, uh, it's the biggest spike of the year. Um, there's lots of different ways to drive spikes in different types of ocean conver conversations. Um, so you can actually take a look at our website. We've got a lot of that detailed. Um, we can show that link out. Um, I'm going to move along so that we have enough time at the end to have everybody share. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what to do with this information um, and how to strengthen the MPA conversation overall. Um, and this applies mostly to California MPAs, but also broadly I said to, um, to different conversations about MPAs in different parts of the world or perhaps protected spaces on land. Um, and overall, there are three things that we think we should do. Um, the first is really, really celebrate and protect these marine protected areas. Really send messages that celebrate and, and, and show the success of California's marine protected areas. The second, um, to say recycle. It's an idea that it can use what's already out there. Uh, a lot of organizations that work on this don't necessarily have the capacity to build a long video or take a lot of high quality photographs. So um, really use the content and the people that are out there for your advantage. And lastly, listen. So this, this conversation is bigger than the conversation um, about new protected areas. It's the conversation about specific places and specific activities and specific species. 
And we really encourage um, people who are active in, in conserving marine protected areas to listen to conversations. So first, um, celebrate and protect. I'm going to jump back to this pie chart that we saw earlier. Um, what we would really love to see, um, and it's already starting to happen, is to increase the slices of the pie that are love and protect. So more evidence marine protected areas are working, more really happy, um, look at this adorable field pictures, uh, more, uh, you know, the surf competition is happening at one of California marine protected areas, more really um, celebratory tweets and Facebook posts and images and videos. Um, and one way to do this is through happy visuals, um, and not just happy, but simple. Um, one animal is, for some reason, far more captivating than a whole flock of animals. Um, and celebratory, cute, that all works. Um, and on the far left, you'll see that there's an infographic that we saw being used over the course of the entire year. And we think it should just keep on being used. It's a very effective visual. It's super simple. Um, didn't try to pack in too much information. It, it delivers a very clear, clear message. It's got an unprotected area on one side and a marine protected area on the other side. More protection, more life. Um, and not just visuals of animals, but visuals with people. Uh, engaging with these places. Um, another way to really have a celebratory uh, tone is to remember that you are human. You are not just uh, you know, working at your job to, to protect these places, but you are a person with a sense of humor and um, a personal investment, I would guess, in the ocean. Um, and I pulled a few examples here of some Twitter accounts that I think do this very well. And all of them are interested in, in science and uh, in nature and the natural world. They've got a few tweets on the left from Smokey the Bear, and he's making jokes about um, uh, uh, he's got the burn down for what uh, image there, and it's a play on words on the very popular song right now. Um, and things like the bottom left, he added a hashtag nature, and he, it's a quote from Albert Einstein, and it says hashtag added. Very tongue in cheek, um, but it works. It gets a lot of engagement. Um, you may be familiar with the Curiosity rover from the Mars mission. Um, that's just a huge tre treasure trove of uh, very, very effective science tweets. Um, in the bottom is Carl the Fog. That's a embodiment of a natural phenomenon, and it is so popular in San Francisco Bay Area. And we've already got that for California. We've got the Pacific Ocean, and I think it's really, really captivating to people to give a, a natural place a voice. But that voice should be human. It should convey a personality. Um, the second thing, uh, use what's out there. So. You can curate from enthusiasts. There are so many photographers that go and visit um, these protected areas. And if you, <coughs> if you want to, you can use uh, tools like Gramseed, and you can pull in um, uh, mentions from a specific place. I'll mention that again later. But you can find really great photographs from specific places, and you don't have to send a phot photographer out there yourself. Um, the one thing that I would caution against is uh, copyright infringement. Um, the two tweets I've, I've actually highlighted here, they've got an incredible amount of engagement on these two photographs, but neither one of them credits the original photographer. So some of these high-quality photographs have a lot of Internet life to them, um, but if you're going to find one and, sh and share it, make sure to, to find out who originally took it. Um, so using, uh, using other images is one thing. Also using short side campaigns to tie back to marine protected areas. And this could be events. It could be campaigns. Here we've got a photo of the Plastic Pollution Coalition uh, had a display outside of Whole Foods in Petaluma. And it was all water bottles that were collected at Point Reyes, which is a marine protected space. So that is a really great opportunity to educate people about marine protected areas 
You can also tie into beach cleanups um, or even volleyball tournaments, beach volleyball tournaments. So think about what are the different kinds of shoreside activities and um, ocean-related campaigns that could be opportunities to partner with groups. Um, another way to use, use what's already out there is to think about how people use the Internet to interact with these places, the marine protected areas. Um, a lot of people use Yelp to share information about hikes and about good surf spots. And um, that's a lot of the different kinds of activities that you're seeing at these marine protected areas. So go to Yelp if there's not already a page for a conservation area that you're working on. You can create it. Uh, you can ask people on Twitter to post a review. Um, you can actually, if a lot, I know a lot of groups have been actively engaged in, in installing signage at the marine protected areas, and you can put a little sticker on there and says, rate us on Yelp. Um, and that way, people, when they search, they can see uh, real life testimonials from people. And another thing is thinking about the activities that people are going to be doing, diving, tide pooling, and making sure that you're tying in your online content to those kinds of activities. Um, so really putting yourself in the shoes of somebody that's going to visit a marine protected area. Um, and I was really thrilled to see uh, when I searched Google for diving California and tide pooling California, the first results were both um, mentioned marine protected areas. And another really important thing is to think about who your brand ambassadors are. And I don't mean brand for your organization. I mean brand for the marine protected area. The ocean has a brand. The uh, Point Reyes has a brand. It's different from the brand of, uh, for instance, Catalina. All of these places have their really unique brands. And there are people who interact directly with people who visit them, and they are your brand ambassadors. It could be anybody from a whale watching company um, to a surf, surf spot. It could also be, I found a couple of uh, Twitter accounts that just send tons of messages about how cool California is, and they've got tens of thousands of followers. Um, it could be local photographers. I found a photographer uh, near San Diego who photographed a lot of beautiful places near Hoboya. Um, and then even brewing companies and, and wineries. Um, these are all places and, and that directly uh, talk to the people that visit these places. And it's one thing to just call them up and say, hey, just, uh, you know, just to remind you, you're next to a marine protected area. It's another thing entirely to supply them with content that they can share on their Facebook. Make it as easy as possible for your brand ambassadors to send messages that are important to you. Um, it's not sending them a press release. It's giving them shareable content, it's giving them photographs and images and messages that they can directly use in their Facebook pages and their Twitter accounts. Another thing to, to know is that uh, you can't really participate in a conversation if you're not listening to it. So um, this is listening beyond your brand. It's not just paying attention to who is mentioning Ocean Conservancy today or who is mentioning Ocean Science Trust today. It's who is mentioning underwater parks or surfing in California. And the tool that I use for this is TweetDeck. And there are other tools, but this is the one that I know and I champion because it gives you a lot of options for listening. Um, this is Twitter only, uh, and it shows uh, constant running stream of mentions of specific terms. So you can do a hashtag for hashtag Calif MPAs. Um, you can also, in the middle column, I've taken a, a search for surfing and California, and I've made it so it only shows me results that have images in them. So I'm only going to get high quality images of surfing in California. Um, you can also, the next column over to the right, uh, I have a search for marine protected. I did that because it's either marine protected area or areas or places. I just chose that term and I filtered it to show me only tweets that have gotten at least two retweets. So this is only going to show me content that is already primed for engagement. Um, somebody has already thought it was good enough to retweet. 
So um, things like this, and if, if you're interested in, in the usage of a term like underwater parks, see how people are using it, who's using it, um, and really amplify it when, when people do use it if you want it to be used more. One reason to listen is to support your peers. Um, the hashtag Calif MPAs that we have mentioned, this is the usage of that. Um, these are all weekly points, um, weekly volume on Twitter for this hashtag. Um, and you'll notice the big spike. That is that uh, tweet, Twitter meetup that we mentioned. But there's all sorts of um, moments over the course of 2013 that people use this term. And it's a great way to talk to other advocates. Um, it's not likely to be picked up by millions of people <laughs> in California, um, but it's an excellent way to have a conversation with peers and to listen to them um, so you can amplify great content. So if you put that hashtag in there, um, it only works if you're listening to it as well. So it's not good enough to just put a hashtag. You have to listen to it, and then you can support people by amplifying their content, responding to their questions, um, and, and really helping to get that message to a broader audience. Another reason to listen is to curate. This is a huge reason that I listen. I listen to a lot of conversations at the topic level. And I mean by searching for the word ocean acidification on Twitter and reading every tweet about it. And it's because I find excellent content that way. And it's news articles, and it could also be really great videos and stories. And stories are an incredible way to get people to connect with natural places. Um, one of the biggest spikes in um, when we did our case study on the Farallons, the Farallon Islands, um, was about um, a swimmer in April 2014 who repeated a swim from the Farallon Islands to um, San Francisco. And it hadn't been done since 1967. And then there's this great video that, um, that was shared and what's really interesting is that this, this whole swimming to protect marine protected areas is it's just still a thing that's going on. This article on the right just came out um, two days ago. It's, it's a swimmer who's trying to spread the message, and it's something that people connect with. Um, so if you're listening to these conversations, you can find these, these great stories that help people understand um, why these places are important. And um, I ask, is your MPA geotagged? Uh, I would guess that some of you are, have an invested interest in some of the marine protected areas in California. Um, and one of the best ways to find content about that place is to search by a geotag. But it only works if your MPA is geotagged. So you can actually add a place. If you were to visit um, a marine protected area, you can actually go into the uh, location menu inside of Instagram or inside of Facebook or inside of Yelp and add a location. Um, on the left is a search in GramFeed. Um, that allows you, it's a, it's a website that you can go to. You can search by location and it will show you images that were posted at or near that location. So these are some images um, that were posted near La Jolla. And, um, on the right is a locations menu that I actually brought up on my own iPhone. I was in Monterey, and I wanted to see while I was on the pier if there were any uh, ocean places that would show up on the menu. They are all um, land-based. Land <laughs> so I, I just wanted to highlight that there's a lot of opportunity. Um, people really enjoy to say, like, you know, I posted this from, you know, the seal rock or whatever. I mean, it, it's really it's interesting to think about how you can um, strengthen the connection between somebody and the ocean place by just allowing them to tag their photograph at that place. So, um, yeah, I would just say search for geotags. It's a great way to find great content. So this is uh, another chance for Q and A about um, about our recommendations. Um, Oh, um, there's um, a question in the chat from Erin. Do you see that? I do. Um, I also see the one above that. Uh, can a location that is not necessarily geographic, e.g., a center with an MPA mission, be geotagged? 
anything can be geotagged. Um, it has to be something that people would want to choose on the menu when they're when they're nearby. But you can go in and you can add a location. Um, so anything can be. Um, Apple's office is geotagged. <laughs> um, and then the second question I see is, did you come across any negative buzz in the conversation about MPAs? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> there were a couple of moments that uh, you know, we would see a very, very small, tiny, tiny spike. And I'm talking about 10, 15 mentions, and we would drill down into it, and we would see some, somebody who seemed rather grumpy posting on Facebook publicly. And um, it would hit our uh, searches because there would be a bunch of comments, and it would be from the same person. It was just somebody shouting into the ether. Um, but there was not a lot of uh, conversation-oriented oppositional uh, content. So awesome job. <laughs> that's, like, that's a really, really, really great finding. Part of why um, we were so excited at Upwell about doing this research is because we know it's been a long, hard slog to actually get these protections passed. Um, and there's a kind of now what moment. Now, now what do we do? They're, it's protected, but there's going to need to be um, ongoing oversight and funding for enforcement and education. Um, and so we hope at Upwell that this research that we've done can help to provide a, a baseline of a snapshot in time where we're at right now and to help identify um, opportunities for investment, opportunities for um, uh, collaboration and coordination um, and we know that there's already a bunch of great efforts going on. I'm so excited that um, you and Samantha um, and Greg, there are lots of voices who are sharing out um, really cool stuff that's already underway, lots of great ideas. Um, and we have people doing work all over the world, like Deb, um, who can help call on for inspiration. Um, but I think it's likely that there, there is an opportunity um, and probably some efficiencies of scale um, that can be um, used even more than what's happening right now um, to make sure that, that our beautiful, beautiful oceans in California um, stay well protected. Um, and with that, I'll pass it to Ray. Um, do you want to wrap us up and, and talk about any next steps? Sure. Um, and I, I, I don't have much to add to that. I think it's, um, it's definitely an, an opportunity. And um, for, we, we do try our very best to do that on a lot of different issues um, related, related to the ocean more broadly than California. Um, we get the TIDE report. Um, you can sign up for that on our website. Um, I would also I really would like to hear from everybody else who maybe didn't get a chance to talk. Uh, when you close down the window for the uh, webinar, there will be a link to a survey or a box where you can put in your comments. Please, please put in your comments. We really want to hear from you. Uh, what did you like? What, did, what do you want to hear from us? Is there any uh, information that you would love to get from us? Anything like that? Put it in the box. There's also a link to that uh, Central Coast Monitoring Survey for those of you who are at all engaged in Central Coast monitoring efforts. Um, and with that, I think um, we are uh, 15 minutes behind the end of this, but I, I, I appreciate everybody who stayed on the line. Thank you so much. Um, Definitely send us tips uh, and send us your comments and all of that. And thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thanks, Carl.